Thank you for inviting me. I'd start with a question, and the question is, history or hair story? And this is the question that has been long debated since the 20th century among different groups of women in developed societies. Those women in developed societies have really moved along the continuum from history into her story. And they are in different stages and they're still moving. Yes, women on the other side of the world, what is grammatically called or politically politely called the developing societies, these women are not yet there. And I would like to stop here and say something about the English grammar used in developing. There is nothing developing in developing in these developing societies. And the ING there is the English grammar's way of perpetuating being stuck. And this is it. Women in developing society are still asking a question whether to write the self, the subject that should be do, doing the writing, the subject that is a prior to the writing of the history or his story or her story or any rewriting. And they are there in the question of why politics, ethnicity, religion, economy, technology, everything and everybody is hindering the writing of a self that should be writing the story, should be writing the history, and should be writing any narrative of a self and society and community. Now, would it thus be surprising mm -hmm. to say how complex, how painfully complex it is to be a woman, a woman who is Arab, a woman who is Arab and Muslim, a woman who is Arab and Muslim, and member of minority, a woman who is Arab, Muslim, member of minority, and Israeli. How complex could that, could that be? And I have to tell you, there is something interesting about this complexity, and the fact that this complexity is a dynamic of the clashing variables at the same time, and at the same time, it's a status quo. So, the clashing variables are, Arab contradicts Israeli, Israeli contradicts Muslim. Muslim contradicts women. Women are being marginalized by Arab. Arab marginalizes Israel. Israel marginalizes everybody else and the rest of the world. And the rest of the world marginalizes all of the above. And these clashing variables are going nowhere. They love to clash. And this is why they are a status quo. Where does this status quo of clashing variables leave a woman who is Arab, who is Muslim, who is minority, and who is Israeli? In the arena of tension between her own, not anybody else, her own two ambivalent attitudes. On the one hand, she wants, and she so much wants, to belong to her own society, her home tradition, her safety. She wants to be there the mother, the daughter, the partner, yet she's aware that this home culture with its heavily suffocating tradition places variable rings around her neck, her mind, her body, her heart, and her present and future, and name it. She's ambivalent. On the other hand, these women, us, Look at the other side, this Israeli society, and we admire the liberal lifestyle. We want so much, and we envy so much our Jewish sisters who have it, who are in an advanced station toward liberalism, toward self-fulfillment. Yet, at the same time, we are aware that these women, or this society, hinders our integration into this liberal lifestyle. <coughs> It invisibly and visibly places obstacles towards our acceptance. There is a blindness, and I have to tell you a personal story here about blindness of the Israeli side. And another story also about the suffocation of the frames in my tradition. But first, this one. A few months ago, I have met a Jewish professor in my college, in Qasimi College, an Arab education college in an Arab Muslim town. And after talking to him for a while, he said, Wow, Dalia. You're married to an Arab, and you work in an Arab college. Wow, I admire you. I have to admit, it took me a while. It really took me a while. Even me with
with all the literature and the talking and the complexities. It took me a while. Oh God, you did not think I'm an Arab. <laughs> How strong is the stereotype? How painful is the stereotype? The stereotype? And then said, I went. That's good material for talks. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the situation. Now in this tension of arenas between ambivalent attitudes, I have to tell you that this leaves the community of Arab, Israeli, Muslim women in here, in this land, in a situation of total poverty and total ignorance. 78% of Arab women in Israel are outside the, force, the workforce. 80% of them never pursue higher education. And this is, speaking of home tradition, this is due to something that is called what? The disguise of the good Arab woman. And this disguise of the good Arab woman is, says the following, honey, keep the home, the house windows shining, and so your husband to smile. And this is a good Arab woman. This shining the husband's smile and shining the windows of the house, I have to tell you, leaves no time for career, self-fulfillment, expression, political, entrepreneurship, any of the above. And this is exactly the question I have been debating with my dear husband 10 years ago when I started turning from work-oriented into career-oriented. He said, dear, I'm very supportive of your career. I don't know you're going to be international. But you know, kids need hot meal at 2 o'clock, midday. Home needs to be clean. I said, no, this is solvable. A cleaner can come and help us. He said, no, honey, I love when you clean it. <laughs> and this is the paradox. The new Arab man supports international career directed women ambitious. But first, clean the bathroom. And this is the question. And then I had to go and search where women are most represented, or I have to be frank, not represented at all, education. I'm not going into politics, I'm not going into economy, I'm not going into ethnicity, none, none, culture, because they are not. There is no data for my research. There are no women there. The, the only place that women are there and not there is education. I'm looking at the Arab system of education in Israel, and I have to tell you, 99.999% of teachers, women, 100%, 100, 100, 100% of cleaners, secretaries, servants, women. Headmaster is a man. Vice headmaster is a man. Parents' committees are fathers. The only mother's committees is in the kindergarten. Why? Decisions can be handled. Only there. I would take you further into the textbooks used in the Arab system of education. And further, I would take you into the mother tongue textbooks used for teaching Arabic to Arab kids. The mother tongue text, the Ira'id books, the pioneer translated so books. And these books should be the arena where cultural identity be produced, evolved, formed, developed. These should be where a collective identity, a mirror, a memory, a collective memory be manifest. The question is, or the answer? None of the above. And I have to tell you, this book or series of books called The Pioneer was introduced in the year 2000. The series of books before it called the Manhattan used to include books, uh, tricks that translated from Hebrew, and they used to be about the flag, the Yarkon River, uh, the Independence Day, and they were translated into Arabic, teaching Arabic to Arab kids. I think that the year 2000, the state of Israel realized that Israelization of these Arabs here is not gonna work. So they better give them their own committees of writing books, their own text, their own heritage, and their own identity formation. And what happened is that most of the texts in these books are taken from 1920s, 1930s, 1950s, mostly 1960s, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. They have nothing to do with that. Uh, Arab community in Israel. And most, none of the writers of the text are women, not from inside Israel or outside in Arab countries. And I have to go into looking for mothers, for females, into the mother tongue book. 
And I found that in the fifth grade, my favorite fifth grade, because my daughter used to be last year, a whole year in fifth grade, so I have learned what she have learned at the same time, and I have taught her to be critical. Almost 70 texts are there, and out of these 70 texts, only four deal with women. And the four deal with women, one is called the mother, the other to my mother, the third, a letter to a mother, and the fourth, smile. <laughs> and I have to tell you that this smile is the most intriguing. Why? Because there is a girl there standing, and the poet addresses her, and he tells her, keep your purity, keep your, keep your whiteness, your virtue, and knowledge not too much, but virtue is important. In brackets, nothingness, no life experience. Keep it white, dear. And this is what, is what is expected out of our girls. And I have to go into the third grade book, more elaborate in this sense. There are two texts that I love most. One is called In the Market, the other called Anisa and Her Father. And I have to tell you about In the Market. The plot goes the following. The plot goes from a daughter and a mother going into the market. The climax of the story goes into picking the right address, purple or blue. I leave you with the metaphor metaphoric implications of the color. <laughs> and then the, the resolution of the narrative is when the right address is found. In Anissa and her father, on the other hand, Anissa and her father, Anissa comes to her father complaining that it's so rainy outside she cannot go and play. On this occasion, the father gives a lecture. Ecology, science. Biology, environment, rain, animals, everything. The father is knowledgeable. The mother is knowledgeable too in the first text. On what? Fashion. The father is knowledgeable about what? Everything else. Science, everything. Knowledge, everything. This led me with a question. Guys, the paradigm has to be broken and immediately. So what I have done is writing my own text. Not in Arabic, in English, because this is where I come. I'm not going to fight the monster in the belly. I'm creating a nice Arab monster besides him in English. So I created my own, my own text in English. And these texts teach identity through English, teach English through identity, and they lead kids from the age four into stage after stage, forming self-awareness of self and other particular and collective, though in a context of contradiction, knowing that they are minority in a state that is ethnically or politically Jewish, at the same time teaching English. The protagonists that go through the books are equally a girl and a boy. And this is how the books, and speaking of mothers, I needed to get regain the respect of my mother tongue. So I started teaching English not from the A, B, C, but from the M, N, B, and A. Why? Because an Arab kid starts learning Arabic from ma, ba, na, a. And these, uh, these three sounds, or four sounds, are already cognitively established in the mind of the kid. But starting with A is apple, B is banana, C is cat, bit weird to Arab kids. So I flipped the paradigm. When I started, and then once they study M, N, A, they have to form a word. So they don't have to go through the whole A, B, C, Z, till they start getting C is a cat and not knowing why, but starting three letters a word, add another letter, more words, and then bridging the gap between sounds and words, letters and words. And when I first started doing that, mothers called me, Dahlia, this is not how English is being told. I said, dear, wait and see. And it turned out that this was the fastest way for Arab kids to start reading English, connecting letters to words. Now, in order to, for these books to be used, there was a need for a frame an educational institution. So I needed to build one. A school after school. A school that is no school. A school that is an alternative school, and I called it Q Schools. And when I shared the idea with my family, they said, hmm, schools, Ugh, doesn't sound right. Why schools? You're a dreamer. 
I said, no, I'm ambitious. And this is how it goes. Q School now has more than 400 kids and more than 12 teachers and mostly are women and it creates opportunities for Arab women who need another woman to create opportunities for them. And I need to go back into my mothering issue as things are yet not resolved heading there. When I first, three years ago, established Q schools after my very demanding career as provost in Al Qasimi, my mother came again. My mother is the guardian of the tradition. And as many, not many, old Arab women in her age, in their 50s, 40s, even 30s, they are very, very loyal guardians of the tradition. She said, first, take care of your husband. Second, do you need money that much? Creating another work after work? I said, damn it, yes, I need that much money. Do you know why I need that much money? Because I need to buy back my respect. I need to buy back my mind. I need to buy back my future. I need to be the partner, the active partner in my family. And I need to be the leader in society. And for that, I need, I really need a lot of money. And as Virginia Woolf said, a room of her own, I think room is not enough, ladies. I think an institution, a business, a big one of her own, would be enough for women who are Arab, Muslim, minority, and try to be Israeli in their spare time, or when they're not being hindered, try to buy back a future and reshape a vision of a self and an other and present and direction into something that is hopeful.